Good afternoon. I can tell there were a lot of people that uh, were touched by John Tenbrook's love and his life, and you're here to cheer up periodically, but to laugh periodically as well, and to celebrate a life well lived and a life that uh, understood deeply the love of Jesus Christ. So let's open in a word of prayer. Father, we come before you this afternoon to celebrate and to grieve our loss of one of your choice servants, John Tenbrook. We just ask that your spirit would permeate this place, that your love would comfort grieving hearts, that in the midst of the tears, we would know the joy of your Holy Spirit, that for those of us who are believers, we know this is not the end. It is just Auf Wiedersehen. We will see you again. So Lord, draw near to us as we collectively gather to grieve, but to grieve with hope. Hope that this isn't the end, that you have given John life that goes on forever and ever and ever. So Lord, we celebrate him this afternoon with tears and with joy because of who Jesus is and all he has done. And it's in his name I pray, amen. I ask Ann now to come and lead us in a hymn. Would you stand and worship with me, please? We're going to sing, It Is Well With My Soul, according to the paper, hopefully, that you got. If you don't have it, we do have hymn books around, but we are adding a verse. So if you're looking at a hymn book, you won't have the second verse, but anyway.
This scripture reading is from John chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. This is Jesus speaking. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how could we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. This is the word of the Lord. try and get through this one. All right. Well, thank you all for coming to celebrate the man I had the honor to call my dad. <clears throat> for, those of you, for those of you that don't know me, I'm the youngest and sometimes in my youth the most troublemaking child of John and Biddy. <laughs> <laughs> you will hear some amazing stories about my dad's life, a few of which I had not even heard until recently. Um, Amazing, just met a, just so many different amazing stories I've heard. That's one of the great things, um, a gift that I've had recently um, about the amazing father, father-in-law, grandpa, uncle, husband, um, and friend of so many. He gave so much to the community, but also de dedicating many hours uh, to me, my siblings, youth, sports teams, basketball, baseball, soccer, softball. <clears throat> At leading Indian guides groups. Uh, for those that don't know, this is like a pre Cub Scouts uh, outdoor adventure group, helping with homework and just spending time with us. Um, he and I shared <coughs> the same passion for sports, and I have we have many great memories of watching mostly Bruins and Red Sox together, whether it was on TV and sometimes um, in person. Uh, we suffered through <laughs> many of the Boston sports heartaches through the <laughs> 80s and 90s as many of you may, may know, uh, before we had our more recent success in the 21st century. Um, but I, I'll share a personal story, uh, one of my first great memories um, together. We were watching, uh, this was the fall of 1986, you probably know where this is going, <laughs> the World Series Red Sox versus Mets. Uh, I was watching together with my dad and Johnny, uh, and it was a back and forth game, and it, it, went to the, the bottom of the ninth and it was going into extra innings and dad was, you know, he was just like, I think I was about 10 years old and he's like, we don't know how long this is gonna go, you gotta go to bed. And much to my, uh, <laughs> much to my protesting, I went to bed. Uh, so when I went to bed, I hadn't even, I hadn't fallen asleep yet and I heard the anguish cries from downstairs <laughs> from Johnny and, and dad. And sure enough, um, he came upstairs, he poked his head in my room and he said, oh, those darn Red Sox did it again. Uh, Oh, well. <clears throat> and so, but it all came full circle. Um, another favorite memory of mine um, in 19, or 2004, when they finally broke the curse, um, I had the honor of taking my dad to the opening day in the spring of 2005 uh, to watch them raise the banner for the very first time. Um, it was a very special memory that we shared together. Um, you know, he was always the fun dad. Pig piles, uh, all the kids, with all the kids and making funny jokes. Um, one of my, he's got many, but one of my favorite uh, sayings he would say, and one of us would say, well, that was close. He would come back with a, well, close only counts in horseshoes, hand grenades, and farts. And many other dad, <laughs> <laughs> and many other dad jokes that made us laugh. Some which I won't share here, but he would always had a, a witty uh, comeback for all different situations. Um, in addition to all his published writings um, that he did uh, with such a talent that he had, one of, the, one of the things I always look forward to uh, was his witty and always entertaining Christmas letter where he loved to brag about his uh, piggy wiggies and grand pigs. Um, and another, another pastime we shared um, was our love of fishing. And so that started when I was little in, the, in Speck Pond in 
in Wilbraham or, or Rummel Pond in, in Vermont, and we'd catch the little sunfish. Uh, and then we'd go um, to our, our grandparents' place in, in Marion, and you know, I'd watch them catch the big blue fish or, or in uh, Nantucket off the shore. Uh, and then when I got a little bit older, I was able to share that experience with them. We'd go out on uh, charter boats and, and catch blues, or, and then later when we got our, our boat caper, um, catching uh, had many great memories of catching uh, bluefish. Uh, one specific memory I'll, I'll say just about my dad, the fisherman. Um, wh when, we, when I was young, we were on the, we used to go out to, um, uh, to Smith's Point, and dad would always fish off the shore until, of course, the, those lousy uh, piping plovers got protected and we couldn't go out there anymore. <laughs> and he would always, just as a side note, he would always, you know, he wanted to, I think we had the, the, the bumper sticker, the piping plovers taste like chicken. That was his big. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that, that, that ruined uh, Smith's point. But um, w one of the memories I have is we were, you know, we were out there and uh, uh, these bluefish were all over the place. Everybody's catching bluefish, reeling them in. And poor dad, much to his disappointment, was not catching a bluefish. Everyone was catching them wrong. And he got, and he got a little frustrated. But then he would always laugh. You know, he would say, um, God would determine with um, each man, some, this, guy, this man will catch fish, this man won't. He said, I guess I'm just one of those guys that just won't catch fish. Well, he did, he did catch a lot of fish in his day, but, you know, he, he would always joke. And, um, and so he just, he loved being around the water and the ocean. You know, sometimes he'd be uh, wandering around the, the water's edge and the, the water, and, and we affectionately call that virgiling, which we'll, we'll, you'll hear a little bit more about that. But uh, so the, he had affectionate name or nicknames for all of us. He was Virgil. Mom was Myrtle. Um, I was Linwood. John was... Um, Billy Joe and, uh, and Bobby Sue. So, he, th so mom and dad had Myrtle and Virgil as their affectionate names for each other. And so that's where Virgiling comes from. Uh, but yeah, he spent many patient hours in, in a canoe uh, in Nantucket um, hunting for turtles or we'd uh, go crabbing or, or just digging for shellfish. Uh, he just loved being outside um, in nature, doing all, all different kinds of things um, with the kids and with his family. I know dad was so many things to so many different people uh, and he hearing all the incredible stories of the considerable impact he had because of his kind spirit and his faith in God. And I did feel fortunate. Uh, we did get to speak one last time before he passed um, and to have that closure. Not everybody gets that and that was, that was important. <clears throat> I know he, you know, he, he had been suffering uh, in recent years. His, his body was giving up, with, giving up on him. Um, and I know he's in a more blessed place with God. And I know he's looking down with us a smile today. I'd like to think I was, I'm carrying on his, his legacy of being the same kind. <laughs> You can do this. All right, here we go. <laughs> Same kind, loving, and dedicated dad to my own uh, piggy wiggies, Jake and Olivia. And maybe someday, not too soon though, <laughs> a grandpa to future grandpigs. <laughs> dad, I love you. I miss you so much, but I think we all have some solace knowing uh, that you're now no longer suffering and in peace in the kingdom of God. Thank you. We're going a little out of order. I'm John. I'm the uh, middle son. Um, and I want to also thank you all for being here and um, to celebrate the life of my dad, who was a gift for so many of us during his lifetime. He lived a full life that seemed to have some unexpected twists and turns. But looking back, I can see God's hand of grace over him in many ways. He was born in Kansas City, Missouri, and he grew up in, as an only child in a wealthy family. He had many advantages, including loving parents, a private school education, and the opportunity to travel. He enjoyed riding the train from Kansas City to Cape Cod in the summers. He was a boy through and through who, like a Mark Twain character, enjoyed fishing, but the ballroom dance lessons that were his mother's idea, not so much. <laughs> he said he would get in trouble with his mother for leaving worms in his pockets that she discovered while doing his laundry. 
and that he used to skip out on dance lessons to go to the movies sometimes. <laughs> he was a serious student, but he knew how to have fun. Somewhere along the way, and this was also by God's grace, he decided that he did not belong in the stuffy high society with its country clubs and status symbols. He was very happy to leave the Midwest and embraced his college experience at Harvard, partying and performing in the Hasty Pudding Show, but not studying or going to class much, <laughs> as he tells it. <laughs> Even late into life, he had anxious dreams about showing up for a final exam, but he had not gone to class or read the material. <laughs> it's funny how the mind works in dreams with the reality filter turned off. <laughs> After graduating with a degree in English, he joined the Navy as a communications officer. The Navy taught him about discipline, neatness, and service to his fellow man and to his country. He enjoyed his time in the Navy, but after he met my mom, the love of his life, and what a bond they share, um, he decided it was time to settle down. Deployments of six months or more at sea was not going, were not going to cut it. Um, after Harvard Business School, he worked a series of corporate jobs, which were at times rewarding and other times exasperating for him. He was a very talented communicator, and he had ample ability to work with numbers, but he found that working with numbers was boring. My parents eventually settled in Wilbraham, Massachusetts, where they raised us three kids and built a life together with dear friends and a salt-of-the-earth church family. With his famous, locally anyway, sense of humor, he, enlived, he livened up any gathering. When the Holy Spirit was moving in the Episcopal Church through a renewal movement called Faith Alive in the late 1970s, there was a Faith Alive weekend held at our church in Wilbraham. By the grace of God, both my mom and dad were captivated by this whole new way of relating to Jesus in a personal and transformative way. This led to other experiences such as Marriage Encounter and Presidio, which enriched and deepened their faith. Dad had a deep, rich intimacy with God, of which we saw some, some in his writings, but much of, went on, much of what went on between him and our Lord will remain a mystery to us. His faith not only changed his life, but through his influence changed many lives. He even changed career paths. He left the corporate world and formed his own venture, which he called Hail for Here Am I, Lord, from Isaiah, based on his uh, freelance writing. This eventually turned into full-time work as a communications director for Brightside for Families and Children, a Christian social service agency in the Springfield area. He joined the Fellowship of Joyful Christians who shared his interest in faith and humor, and he loved to wear a t-shirt depicting the smiling Jesus. But even within the evangelical movement, he did not always go with the crowd. While he took seriously the gospel command to visit those in prison and feed the poor, he was not a fan of the moral majority and was not a culture warrior, and he would never have been accused of being a Christian nationalist. <laughs> Later, for over 30 years, he and my mom poured themselves into, the serving, into serving the incarcerated in the rec jail ministry in the Springfield area. As our Lord promised, the harvest was plentiful in the jail, and they saw the power of God working wonders in the lives of many of the men they served. It started, of course, with God's love, and it all happened out of a great community of volunteers, including my parents. But it was my dad's blend of love, wisdom, and just the right amount of goofiness that reached so many in his audience. You might notice he had a lot of funny hats. More to follow on that. He would be driving us through some sketchy neighborhood in Springfield, and a big, scary-looking guy would run toward the car, knock on the window, and say, hey, Biddy and John, great to see you. I'm out of jail. I have a job. I'm doing great. Thanks. I love you guys. <laughs> My dad was not status conscious and was not into ego possessions like fancy cars, hilltop castles, high fashion, or bling. He had a tendency to wear holes in his favorite clothes and shoes. He was not a fan of celebrities in general, but he loved his Boston Red Sox and also admired many of the greats who played for the Bruins and the Red Sox, and the Celtics, excuse me, um, <laughs> over the years. In music, he often did not go with the crowd. He never loved Elvis or the Beatles. But he loved, he enjoyed uh, Simon and Garfunkel, John Denver, and jazz and classical. He loved the theater, but not the opera. <laughs> According to ancient spiritual guides, there are nine personality types, each one of which reflects one facet of the character of God. Each type, when walking by the Spirit, is able to live into that reflection of God's character, what we call the redeemed type. And each type has its common pitfalls. 
my dad's personality type was the peacemaker, and he lived the redeemed type well. He was humble and so loving and giving, he really reflected God's love to me and to so many others. I know his tremendous love and care for me is a major foundation of my life. One of the best Christmas gifts he gave me was that for a whole year, he would write a daily personal note to me and leave it outside my bedroom door. He was always so encouraging, and he never seemed to tire of telling us, his family, that he loved us. At the end of our lives, what is important is not our possessions or even our accomplishments, but how faithful we were in applying the talents we were given by the light God gave us to bring glory to God. My dad was a rare saint among us who gave glory to God in so many ways. I love you, Dad. Thank you. amazing <laughs> okay I have a few little other details to add but maybe a lot will be repeated um, but anyway as um, I can talk a little bit more about his last day of living since we had a, a day when dad knew he was going so um, I'm Ann the oldest daughter um, only daughter actually kind of special actually being the only daughter <laughs> daddy daughter um, as my dad lay on his deathbed after he told us he knew he was dying and that he was at peace, joking with us, saying things like, stick a fork in me, I'm done. <laughs> he wanted to do what was his normal practice. How blessed we are that this was not something that just happened on his deathbed. He wanted to express his love for all of us in the room individually, and then for those who were out of town by phone call. I am so blessed to be able to say that verbal expression of his dad's love was a normal part of what he did. He never hesitated to say, I love you so much to us. And I am going to say this, that in the last few months, he looked me even more earnestly in the eye more often, saying, because I think he knew he was just giving out. His body was not <laughs> going to be here much longer. Um, so many times, over and over, he did this throughout his life. And I would like to say this short sentence, his was a life of love. Um, I found a handwritten letter he wrote to my oldest son, Michael, his first grandchild, while Michael was still in my womb. Um, and so these, Virgil and Myrtle will come up in this as well, because, and you heard about that from my brother, the nicknames that he gave himself and then mom. Uh, and ever since we three kids were tiny, he would call us his piggy wiggies or his piglets. So he wrote this on Valentine's Day in 1993. And it says this, Dear little giblet yet unborn, you are about to enter a family which is filled to overflowing with love. Your mom and your dad love each other, and you very much. Two sets of goofy old grandparents love each other, and you very much. And a whole host of uncles and aunts out there love you very much. And they are, they are anxiously bursting with love for you. So you will be one deeply and richly loved little piglet. But that's not the best part of this wonderful uh, life that is waiting for you. The best part is that Jesus loves you. Among many prayers in my heart for you, my precious grandchild, is the prayer that you will come to know and love this Jesus, who loves you more than all your anxiously adoring relatives put together. My next most important prayer is that you'll let your old granddad take you fishing once in a while, <laughs> so you just get busy and grow up big and strong and healthy, you hear? With all my tenderest love, Grand Virgil. And now I'd like to tell you about the greatest love of dad's life on this earth, even greater than for his kids and his grandkids, um, uh, uh, and give you the short version of how they met. It was shortly after New Year's Day, 1964, in Virginia Beach, when a dapper young sailor named John crashed a party where beautiful young party-loving Biddy Davis was dancing with her date she was trying to break up with. <laughs> I love that part. <laughs> <laughs> John saw Biddy, made a beeline for her, asked to cut in and dance with her, and the rest is history. I'm not lying. Like, this is really true. <laughs> Eight dates later, about a month and a half uh, after their first meeting, only because Dad had about a three-week uh, time out at, at sea, <laughs> they were engaged. 
They married later that year, the next time John was in court long enough for a honeymoon. This year they celebrate 60 years of total wedded bliss. Mom always says that whenever they had their differences, they just worked it out and, uh, and realized that nothing was worth hurting the feelings of the other. As their daughter, I am so incredibly thankful and blessed to have grown up in such a secure, loving home as theirs. Never once did I have to wonder whether their marriage would go the distance. Friends, getting, friends parents getting divorced all over around me, just such a blessing. Anyone who has spent time around them knows they have been lovebirds all their lives. God's grace is all over their story. I've had the privilege to read through just a fraction of the writings Dad has left behind for us. Dad was not only a prolific writer, he was a great journaler. Over and over, he thanked God for the incredible blessing of his dear Biddy. You wouldn't believe how many times he mentions how loved he felt, especially way back when he had his first cancer experience almost 25 years ago, when mom would have to change his colostomy bag for him when he was still too weak to do it himself. That sort of love was a repeated theme in the last 25 years of their marriage. Dad experienced God's love and grace through the loving and tender care of his precious wife. In Dad's journals, it is beautiful to see the journey God took him on, teaching him about suffering through his cancer experiences. In his journals, he had conversations with God. He says this nine months after his surgery, way back in 2001, his first surgery. Myrtle, bless her heart, has made the decision to turn this whole thing over to you, Lord, and to trust and obey because there's no other way. <laughs> Deuteronomy 27.33 spoke to her. God is my refuge. Underneath are the everlasting arms. She also agrees with some dude named Henry Holland who says that trials are a gift from you, Lord. It is a tremendous moment when first one is called upon to join the great army of those who suffer. Well, Hank, I don't know about your suffering, but I got to tell you, Pilgrim, with my suffering, I am not having tremendous moments here. <laughs> <laughs> I feel weak and old and helpless, and I don't like that feeling. And this is God speaking in all caps. Faith is not a feeling, Virgil. <laughs> Understood, Lord, but how can I be the joyful overcomer you've called me to be when my old body is in discomfort, not always pain, just about all the time? What did the Psalms tell you yesterday, Virgil? Oh, yeah. The Lord will sustain him upon his sickbed. In his illness, thou dost restore him to health. Psalm 41, verse 3. And, but as for me, I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the loving kindness of God forever and ever. Psalm 52, verse 8. That word loving kindness is one of my dad's favorite <laughs> words and one of my dad's favorite facets of the amazing character of God, and he all wanted us to know God's goodness that way. Lord, if you can make me like a green olive tree, it's your decision, Virgil. Trust me. I'm trying, Lord. Help thou my unbelief. Dad was very disciplined and regular in his prayer life. Mom gave me his prayer list. Every morning, he had a list of people he was praying for, and he read his Bible and several different devotional books. If you are in his family, he was praying for you. If you are a close friend, he was praying for you. If you had a serious trial in your life, he was praying for you. One of his favorite quotes was, oh, uh, sorry. If you had a serious trial in your life, he was praying for you. If you don't yet know and follow Jesus, he was praying for you. One of his favorite quotes was this one. I think it's from Charles Spurgeon. Christianity is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Dad loved that saying. What were Dad's beliefs about knowing Christ? Guess what I found? A wonderful list he wrote entitled, What I'm Sure Of. That Jesus is Lord, the incarnation of Almighty God. That Jesus is Savior, the Redeemer of my soul. That Jesus is the only way, truth, and life. That I am a sinner. That I am redeemed by God's grace in Jesus and by nothing I have done. That I can do all things through Jesus and nothing without him. That I experience God through study of his word, fellowship with his people, and prayer and communion with him. That I am not in competition with my fellow believers for the most spiritual award. God sees us all the same. And lastly, that he is God and I am not. 
he wanted to write a book called that. In fact, we have a nice big file of his book, so we'll see if we can <laughs> do something about that with that title. He, got, he has gone there and not. What a legacy he has left to us. I pray we will all follow God, Dad's example. Here's a poem I wrote in 2010 when he was hospitalized up in Massachusetts, probably for a bowel obstruction, while I was here in Florida. And in the poem, I referenced dollies, and we talked about their jail ministry, so they always called the men in jail, I guess we're supposed to call them residents now, but they always called them their dollies, because that shows you their heart of love for these, these people, these men. Um, and so when I reference dollies, that's who it's talking about. Um, I hope this gives you a taste of the great affection my dad and I have always shared. It's called Nobody's Daddy's Like My Daddy. Okay. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, <laughs> some might say I love my daddy. They might even mean it, too. But when I say I love my daddy, I want him to know it's true. Nobody's daddy's like my daddy. I love him so very much. It kills me not to be with him, to feel his sweet, gentle touch. Nobody's daddy's like my daddy. He's selfless no matter what. He'll do anything for anybody. I love him because he's such a nut. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's daddy's like my daddy. He loves Jesus, it's true. He loves to tell dollies about the good news. He tells them, hey, Jesus loves you. Nobody's daddy's like my daddy. Lord, heal him and bring him relief. We all want him well because he's so swell. He's awesome beyond all belief. Nobody's daddy's like my daddy. He showers his love over me. I'm blessed beyond measure, and he is my treasure, as you can plainly see. I love you, daddy. I miss you so much, and I will always carry your love like a treasure in my heart. A wise friend told me that the depth of our grief reflects the depth of our love, and I think that is so true. Thank you for modeling for me the loving kindness, one of your favorite words, of God, my Heavenly Father. And I look forward to joining you in our forever home someday soon. Thank you. This is Romans 12, 9 through 18. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. This is the word of the Lord. This is a song we sang a lot growing up in, in our church in Wilbraham. It's called The Prayer of St. Francis, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace.
Not a lot to say. You can turn this down a little, Jeff. Not a lot to say that uh, John's children have not said. I always think the measure of excuse me, someone's faith is the impact it has on those closest to them. It's easy publicly to proclaim your love and devotion for God. But when those nearest to you feel that, that to me shows the genuineness of his relationship with God. And as we gather, we've gathered again to grieve and to, to shed tears because death still is an enemy. It still is an alien intruder in this creation that God has made that by our rebellion and our own willfulness, we have brought it. Yet that's not the end for those of us who know Jesus Christ. Paul says something oxymoronic in the letter to the Thessalonians. And he says, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who have fallen asleep. That was John's euphemism for those who had died and trusted Jesus. Or grieve like the rest who have no hope. And I love that balance there. We still grieve. And as you've heard, uh, John had sincerely trusted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And that's the hope we have, that Jesus, despite our physical death, a relationship with him goes on forever. Jesus said to another grieving woman, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Hopeful grief. Again, if you are a strict materialist, that sounds like a delusion. If this is all we have, this material world, if we're all here just by chance randomly, John got here by chance and he left by chance, then there's not really a whole lot of hope at times like this. John is gone and that's all. An inscription found in a gravestone in Thessalonica, that same church that Paul wrote to about having a hopeful grief says this, after death, no reviving, after the grave, no meeting again. Life without Christ, that's what it is. One of the wisest kings of Israel came to that same conclusion. He was a brilliant intellect, tremendous naturalist, a phenomenal administrator and judge, one with endless resources and ability to satisfy his every whim. In one part of a book, he says, I denied myself nothing my heart desired. I don't know about you, but unless you're Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, probably that's not a reality that is open <laughs> to many of us. And he pursued life, finding life, what he says, under the sun, on this horizontal plane. And he amassed fortunes. He built incredible palaces and beautiful places. He amassed myriads of sexual experiences and pursued pleasure to the utmost. And at the end of every one of these, he came to this conclusion. Vaporous, vaporous, it's all vaporous. Like a breath on a cold morning that dissipates as the breeze blows by. If it's all vaporous and if death is the absolute end, then we have tremendous reason to grieve. But I think in every human breast, there's this longing for something more. An awareness that we're built for something more than just the 84 or more live years you have in this life. This longing for something that's lasting and eternal. C.S. Lewis says this, if we find in ourselves a longing that nothing on this earth can satisfy, that's a strong indication that we were created for more than just this earth. John discovered that satisfaction of that longing. 
And that was found in his relationship with Jesus Christ. And for all of us who know and follow Jesus Christ, we understand that the event that Christians, the 2.5 billion Christians around this world celebrated last Sunday on Easter is the foundation of our faith. That physical death is not the end. If we know Jesus Christ, we know his life that rose from the grave. And we have a hope, a hope that we will see John again. That this world is not all that there is. So to me, if the resurrection happened, it changes everything. If it truly happened, and I and John and many here believe and we're convinced that it did. Not only were we convinced that it's a historical reality, but we've encountered this relationship with a personal Jesus Christ as we've walked through life. And John, almost 50 years ago, encountered this Jesus and walked with him and lived this out. It impacted his life. If it didn't occur, Paul says, go. Go to the beach, go play golf, <laughs> go party, do something, because if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then your faith, it's vaporous too. But we believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And John Tenbrook bet his life on that fact and lived his life according to that fact. And because of that, and because of his assurance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can celebrate today. We grieve, yes, but it's our grief. John suffered much in these last years. And I too, being a Chicagoan, know the pain of following a team for years and years <laughs> and years, but ultimately bringing to that point of satisfaction. And we have hope for all of us who trusted Jesus Christ and believe that he rose from the dead, that we will encounter John in the presence of our Savior. John was a gifted man, gifted to be born into a family that loved him and that provided for him so many opportunities, gifted intellectually, you don't go to Harvard and you don't get an MBA there if you're a slouch, <laughs> even though he may not have gone to class that much. <laughs> I have a brother like that drives me nuts. <laughs> he was gifted materially, he was blessed with good jobs, nice homes, vacations in Nantucket and places to ski, gifted with a love for oysters, <laughs> not so gifted with the consumption of vegetables. <laughs> Gifted with an adoring wife and loving kids and grandkids. Gifted with an amazing sense of humor. Yet John was also gifted to understand that all his gifting wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to give meaning and purpose and hope in this world. It wasn't enough to reconcile him to his creator and forgive his sins. As nice as John was, he realized that he was not perfect. When we think of sin, we think of those awful things, but sin is basically de -godding God. Our wanting to play God, our wanting to determine in our own lives what's right, what's wrong, I'll do it my way, I'm master of my faith and captain of my own destiny. And John was willing to humble himself and say, no, there's a master that's greater than me. And he also recognized, and this was a gift, that his gifting wasn't enough to give him eternal life and to conquer his physical death. And because of that, John trusted that Jesus indeed is the crucified and risen Son of God, and he sought to follow him. And we see that evidenced in John's deep love for his family and his friends. I read in his obituary, he had a saying, love people and use things. I love that. It's evidenced in his love for the least and the cast off and those so many in society write off as undesirable and 
John, despite all his privilege and position, said, nah, they're not any worse than I am. I need God's love, and so do they. And it was evidenced by his joy and humor right up to the very end. I was talking to a friend that said, talking to somebody, they're going to move up to uh, the Northeast, and said, you got a shellfish allergy, and John said, I think I would shoot myself if that <laughs> happened. <laughs> I love that. But if John could return, I would imagine he would say something like this. <laughs> I would want nothing more than for you to know and love the Lord and Savior of my life, Jesus Christ. God bless you all as you grieve and as you laugh and celebrate. John Tenbrook. Okay, let's stand and worship the Lord together with the second hymn on your sheet, How Great Thou Art. It's also in a hymnal, if you, um, I forget, maybe 524, if it's in the hymnal, then you... God loved this hymn.
You can remain standing. Am I missing something? No. Okay. Yes, okay. You all are invited to lunch next door, again, to celebrate uh, John's life and his legacy. I want to close with uh, a prayer that Anne sung. Um, this is the prayer of St. Francis that I think John's life embodied very well. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. May the peace of God be with you all. God bless you. Amen.